गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एंड वेलकम टू दिस ऑन गोइंग स्पेशल सीरीज ऑफ लेक्चर्स ऑर्गेनाइज बाय द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश इन कोलोबरेशन विद आई क्यू एस सी के दस कॉलेज एंड टूडे हैपन्स टू बी द लास्ट डे ऑफ दिस होल लेक्चर सीरीज सो फार वी हैव कंडक्टेड इलेवन लेक्चर इलेवन लेक्चर्स इंक्लूडिंग टू डेज वन एंड वी आर क्वाइट हैप्पी दैट वेरियस स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम अदर कॉलेजेस have successfully joined us and participated in the interactive session and enjoyed the class thoroughly uh for today's speaker we would like to let you know we would like to let you know that uh our honorable principal of women christian college dr rajan topal has already joined us now may i request to our honorable principal dr ramkrishna prasad chakraborty to welcome her and say a few words over to you sir morning my dear students special thanks to dr rajan tapal the colleagues our principal of women's christian college thank you madam coming here to support our student what we are doing in every institution here our intention was to form a classroom with the student of different institution and uh, 105 student joined here in the classroom and they can uh, interact with the teacher in the classroom beside that Due to the net connectivity problems, they can get the lecture in the classroom, Google Classroom, any time. So this was our venture, and we want to proceed with this series, the first in West Bengal, I think. So if it is possible, and Madam Ajanta Pal, we heartily welcome you in this uh, series of lectures, and today is the last day, so. uh in the bengali we know that of halo jar says halo and that will be happen today and he is a uh, authentic person for discuss on the topic as what is assigned today so i think all the student will enjoy the lecture and dear my dear student please put your feedback to so give your feedback which will be assigned in the classroom and your feedback is very much essential for us for proceed further what is your demand whether we are able to satisfy you or not that we want to know so thank you very much once again all the students and special thanks to colleague principal dr ajun tapal thank you monimes a prof thank you sir thank you for your encouraging words uh, now may i request to our speaker honorable principal dr ajanta pal uh, women's christian college to proceed her deliberation and she will be talking on a brief overview of american literature over to you ma'am thank you very much am i audible yes um, yes ma'am you are complete cleared thank you dr ramkrishna chakraborty principal of kekidas college and um, uh, also the english department of the college and the iqac for having organized this series this series of lectures one second and for uh, uh, having invited me for having extended this uh, a very uh, honorable uh, invitation to me to come and uh, deliver a talk now if you have considered the topic you know a brief overview of american literature well brief is there but the word is there but i don't know but to bring that entire uh, history of some 400 years uh, within a 
talk spanning just about one hour, it would be difficult. So basically what I would like to do is just touch upon some of the salient points, the important milestones, the important junctures, the strategic junctures in the uh, development of the nation of America. Because, you know, as uh, we all know, that uh, students of English literature, they are usually given a basic background on uh, the history of English literature. Some classes are, you know, uh, allotted to this particular component in the syllabus. But American literature, it is a, a huge territory and most of the students are not familiar with it, you know. So that is why I feel, this is what I do with my own students as well. Before beginning a text, you know, I give them an extensive two-period lecture, talk, spread over maybe two classes two, on two days, to acquaint them with the notion of America, what it is historically, how it evolved, how it came into being, what happened thereafter, and the geographical dimensions of the nation, the important political uh, discourses that took place here. You know, so these things are very important. Otherwise, the if, if the students are not aware of the political, social, economic, and cultural history of the country, how will they be able to identify with what is being taught in class? So ideally, this should have been at the beginning, since most of the lectures were on American literature. Never mind, it is as long as the students get to know something about it. I'm sure, students, that you will be able to understand the texts, you know, and there are many iconic texts in your uh, American literature syllabus. So hopefully my entire endeavor today, this morning, is that you will be able to understand, you know, and connect with the text. Oh, the, this text belongs to this period, and this was the ideology during the rounds then. This artistic movement was happening, you know. So very briefly, I shall try to put before you, as I said, the salient points of this nation. And basically, it will be uh, the historical, a brief historical overview of America. And uh, with, I, I cannot possibly touch on all the genres, as in poetry, prose, drama. So I have taken poetry to be the representative genre here. And as we move on uh, through the talk, I shall use these examples from poetry as illustrative instances. OK? So let us begin with the beginnings. How did this nation come about? How did it form, come to be formed in the first place? We have to remember the Puritan migrations from the old world to the new. Now, when I use the word old world, you would want to know what it is. Most of you are aware of it, but still I would like to point out that the old world in this context stands for Europe, for England, for Europe, the continent of Europe, and America, Canada, uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, these countries make up the new world, okay? So the old world, the moment we use this term, it is associated with uh, a very old, uh, sophisticated, but a decadent culture to some extent. And the new world has hardly any history, you know. It is made up by immigrants, you know. It is a completely different culture. But there's a lot of energy, a lot of dynamism, a lot of industry. You know, the people who settle there are hardworking. So the ethos of the old world and the new are totally different. With that, I'll come to the one of the first words that are used in this context, the Puritan migrations. Puritan, capital P-U-R-I-T-A-N, this stands for a particular sect in Protestant Christianity. We know that there are two main denominations in Christianity. One is the Catholic, the older Catholic faith, and the other one is the Protestant one. And the, amongst the Protestants, the Puritans were particularly austere and severe, and they only recognized the Holy Bible as their uh, text. And they lived life and they negotiated life according to their understanding of the Bible. Now, what happened was that in England, uh, in the 17th century, you know, there was a lot of persecution that the Puritans had to face, you know, from the 
the, the Catholics, you know, and that they were called the Laudians. They organized themselves into a movement under Bishop Lord, and so the Puritans were being hounded from the shores of England. So many of them went to Holland, you know, uh, which had become a, a, a center of uh, Protestant uh, learning and also a refuge from the Protestants all over the world. And many of them made the journey across the Atlantic from England, from the shores of England, to America. So these were the iconic voyages. When I refer to the Puritan migrations, you must have heard of the Pilgrim Fathers who crossed the Atlantic from England to America aboard a ship called the Mayflower. Now, this migration took place in the year 1620. And 10 years later, another lot. In the Mayflower, there were some 600 pilgrims. And in 1630, the ship called Arbella, under the leadership of John Winthrop, crossed the Atlantic with some 100 pilgrims. You know, So in the first instance, we find William Bradford leading the flock of pilgrims. In the second instance, it is John Winthrop. And it is they who established the first English colonies on American soil. Right. So Bradford in 1620, after a most eventful and adventurous voyage across the Atlantic, finally managed to land at a place called Plymouth Harbor, P-L-Y-M-O-U-T-H, Plymouth Harbor, which is on the eastern seaboard of the great American continent. And so this was called the Plymouth Plantation or Plymouth Colony, the first one. And... Uh, the first New England colony or the first Puritan colony. And then we find those who came in 1630 and they settled in what is known as the Massachusetts Bay Area. Okay, So we have the establishment of the first English colonies in American soil and the colonization of the eastern seaboard of the new continent. Right Now, so what happened was that uh, already in Virginia, lower down south uh, colony had been established. But I draw your attention to what is known as the Puritan colonies. And the five Puritan colonies on the east coast of America are Plymouth, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts Bay. Okay, And additionally, there was the colony of uh, Virginia close by. There is a lot to be said about all this, but I will not go into all that. But I will just tell you a little about the Puritan dispensation in America at this time. Now, I've already told you what the, what kind of the theological tenets, what kind of Christian tenets they followed. You know, they were very austere. They looked down on any kind of entertainment. They interpreted the Bible absolutely literally, and they applied this interpretation to their understanding and negotiation of the world around them. So as you can imagine, you know, not much descriptive or imaginative literature could possibly be written during this time. So the major part, the major genres which were produced during the Puritan uh, period in American history would be the uh, would be historical in nature. There were the diaries and journals of William Bradford and John Winthrop. You know, these were the main uh, literary as also the historical documents of the time. These are the, the history of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford and the journal by John Winthrop. You know? So now when I talk about the Puritan period, this would be uh, from around 1620 till the end of that particular century. That is the end of the 17th century. Now this is known as the first colonial period in America. And the second colonial period would be from 1700 to 1775, you know, when the country became a, a sovereign nation. So the, there are two colonial periods. The first one is called the Puritan period, which we are doing now. Now, there were, one shouldn't conclude that there were no poets at all. Some poetry did come to be written during this time. And the two most noteworthy poets of this era are Anne Bradstreet and Edward Taylor. Okay. And so why did Bright, uh, sorry, while Bradstreet is the Puritan woman of the new world, negotiating her dual identity and role as homemaker and poet in a largely patriarchal setup, 
Edward Taylor is deeply influenced by the English metaphysical poets whose style he recuperates in all its complexity. So the influence of the old world, the, the literary influence of England, you know, continue, continues to be present in the literary articulations of the colonial, uh, the, the, of the colonies. Another type of writing that was popular during this period was theological literature, such as sermons, Jeremiah's, you know, translation of the Psalms and various ecclesiastical tracts and treatises. Right. So this is all I have to discuss. I mean, very briefly, I've tried to put before you what exactly was the Puritan period like and what led to the inception of America. So America began with the establishment of the colonies, first colonies on its uh, seaboard, on the eastern seaboard. And then it began to grow from that point westwards. Okay, so I will talk about the geographical expansion as also the historical evolution of the nation. So the 17th century is this. We move on to the 18th century, okay, and this is known as the period of enlightenment or deism, capital D-E-I-S-M. Now the enlightenment, enlightenment period, all of you are familiar with, and it has, it's there in English. Uh, literature in the history of English literature as well. Basically, it means that you know, uh, religion began to take a bit of a back seat, and science, empirical science, you know, with its questioning nature and with its insistence on evidence, you know, came to be regarded quite highly, right? And this uh, rational, it espoused rationality. You know, the faculty of reason was very important during this time, as also the industrial developments which it brought in its way. So this was the 18th century or the period of enlightenment or deism. Deism is that God is not only outside us, but it is also within us. You know, so we are manifestations of the divine entity in a sense. So, you know, this kind of uh, the anthropomorphic interpretation of religion, that man is also at the center of things, man is also important, right? And so in the 18th century, the strong Puritan focus and orientation with which the country had begun, began to become a little less. The pronounced belief in reason and the laws of nature over supernatural phenomena, over superstition, you know, broadened the outlook of the people as they embraced the scientific, rational, and empirical spirit. To this was added the commercial, inventive, and entrepreneurial impetus of the age, which to an extent, you know, laid the foundations of an individualistic and capitalistic ethos that came to characterize the nation. Today we talk about um, capitalist America. So we should go back to its very beginning, to the 18th century, when for the first time this kind of an entrepreneurial and individualistic, you know, commercial ethos came to occupy the minds of the people. So we, what we find basically is that in the 18th century, as distinct from the 17th century, theological imperatives began to be broadened by secular concerns and narrowly moral preoccupations by mercantile or commercial interests, right? Now, while talking about the 18th century, uh, I would also like to draw your attention to, you know, there were certain myths which are uh, integral to America. One of these myths, the early myth, was that of the frontier, the Western frontier, okay? This was called as the, called the frontier myth. Now, from 1606, when the first colony had been established, when the first English colony had been established in, on American soil, namely Virginia, to 1775, that is the war of independence fought by the 13 colonies against Britain, against Imperial Britain. So this period covers about some 170 years. And during this period, the American settlers belonged to the land, you know, to all intents and purposes. They had undertaken an arduous voyage. They had come here and they had settled. They had tamed the land. They had established the supremacy of the um, Native Americans. But technically, the land did not belong to them. 
for they were still British colonists. So their identity was that they still owed allegiance to the British crown. Right. So with the colonists' victory in the War of Independence waged against Britain in 1775, only then were they able to become a free nation. In this regard, Robert Frost, the 20th century American poet, has a very beautiful poem called The Gift Outright. And I shall quote a few lines from this poem to uh, impress upon you, you know, the peculiar conundrum which was faced by the people at this time. I'll read out from the gift outright. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England's still colonials, possessing what we still were possessed by, possessed by what we now no more possess. So this is a wonderful, you know, exploration and expression of this peculiar dilemma in which the colonials, first colonials found themselves. They say, Frost says, the land was ours before we were the land. So they spent these years from 1506 to 1775, you know, in this kind of a, a peculiar condition where the land was theirs, but they were not the land because they were still British colonials, you know. They possessed something which they, you know, of which they were not actually the true owners and they were possessed by a power that is the British crown, which they no longer possessed. Okay, so the now I get back to the frontier saga. So as I told you, the frontier was the western frontier. Now, the people had settled in the eastern part of the eastern coastline. Now from there, gradually, they began to advance westwards. And when they did that, they began to, you know, cut the, what do you call, they began to cut the forests and the, uh, what do you call, the trees, and they made clearings, and they were called the, uh, they were, they, these people, they were called the pioneers, you know, P-I-O-N-W-E-R-S. They were the pioneers who, you know, packed their families and belongings on carriages and carts, and they made this enormously difficult, they undertook this difficult journey, you know, across the breadth of the continent. Because, you know, the Western, the West was um, a region of mystery, of adventure, of everything that was unknown. So once they had tamed the Eastern coast, they began to gradually venture outwards. So this was what was known as the saga of frontiering or the myth of the Western frontier. So they began, they had to cut down forests, cleared the way, they had to overcome opposition from the various Native American tribes who already occupied these spaces. So the myth, the myth of the Western frontier recognizes that the United States developed as a settler state, which grew geographically and increased in political and economic power by advancing European settlements into the territory of Native Americans and the so-called wilderness. Since the literal frontier closed more than a century ago, the conceit of limitlessness, you know, the frontier um, uh, kind of symbolized the notion of limitlessness, but it had to be closed historically and geographically. And after that, this whole notion, this myth, served to justify expanding America's borders first into a worldwide military empire and then commercial globalization. Two very important points in the present context. You see, America just could not get over this whole notion of frontiering. Even when they reached the West Coast and would have, would have seen the Pacific Ocean, so they have made the journey from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. You know, there was no more land to conquer. So what did they do then? Then they began to branch out into making a worldwide military empire and then the commercial globalization through which they tried to conquer the entire world. Now, while the saga of Westering continued for three centuries, we shall take a look at the important historical events and developments which marked the momentous milestones in the life of the colonial settlements on American soil. As 
these settlements gradually kind of developed into a fledgling nation. So you see, a nation is not born overnight. It takes years, decades, centuries. So we have to uh, think of now, there were initially the 13 colonies. The 13 colonies on American soil. And these 13 colonies gradually grew, you know, Initially, they had a Puritan style of functioning where the state and the church were almost one unit. Then in the 18th century, things became a little different. But in we have the war of American independence. The terminology differs depending on which side of the fence you are on because the British people called it the American Revolution, and the colonialists called it the American War of Independence, which lasted from 1775 to 1783, culminating in the resting of sovereignty by the Americans. Okay, Now, in this regard, there is this uh, document called the Declaration of Independence. You know, this is part of the Constitution you know, of America. And this Declaration of Independence is a historical document, an ideological testament, a foundational metaphysics, and also a seminal articulation, enshrining the political vision of the founding fathers of the American Republic. Now, I must, I have to read out a portion from this, because later on we shall be discussing the myth of the American dream, the idea of the American dream. So this will come in useful. I quote from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, unquote. I decided to read out the entire paragraph because in this you find in a germinal form the whole theory of American democracy. You know, how the people, their right is also very, very important. And the goals that were held sacred by the founding fathers of the Republic. And which were these goals? These were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this came to symbolize, stand for the very ethos of the nation. You know, Now things have changed so drastically, you will be able to see, find out on your own. So, and this is what spurred people from all quarters of the globe, you know, to, to flock to America, right? To flock to America. It, it is said that America is a nation by the immigrants and for the immigrants and formed by the immigrants. You know. So you see, right from the Puritan migrations to the later times, people kept coming. Almost every family in Kolkata, India, has some relatives settled there. So why do they go to America? Because it is a land of opportunity, it's a land of prosperity. At least it used to be till a few decades ago. You know, It was a land of freedom, above all. It will help you to become what you want to be. You know, So that is very important. So we have the war of independence, which the colonists fought against the British crown, and finally they were able to become free as a nation, and George Washington was the first president, and during the 18th century, uh, the literature of the times began to be uh, occupied with questions about American identity and the formulation of geographical and social discourses concerning the infant nation. So, if the 17th century saw the establishment of the 13 colonies on American soil. The 18th century witnessed expansion. So from establishment, we move on to expansion, as in the scope of territory, the scope of operations, and also in the scope of the attitude. You know, they were not narrowly 
religious and puritanical any longer. And literature during this age, that is 18th century, was dominated by prose writings because it was an age of enlightenment, awakening and reason in Europe as in America. Prose, all kinds of prose, ethnographic, expeditionary, ecclesiastic, philosophical, political, journalistic or scientific came to dominate the literary expression of the time. Like I'll just refer to one of the, uh, some of the very important documents and like J. Hector St. Jean de Crevacure had written a work called Letters from an American Farmer in 1782. And in this work, Crevacure asks, poses the question, who is the American? And later on, he goes to answer the same question, goes on to answer the same question that the American is a free citizen of a free country. You know. Then we have Thomas Paine's various works, The Rights of Man, The Age of Reason, Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, you know, William Byrd, Thomas Jefferson, and so on. So these great uh, statesmen, some of them are great statesmen, revolutionaries, you know, and um, the, 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 who helped to construct the pillars of the new nation, you know. So they, through their work, their work basically uh, charts the intellectual and commercial trajectories of the unfolding American psyche and pursuit. Thomas Jefferson, who had become the vice president and later on become the president of America, developed the concept of a, I quote, populistic agrarian republican democracy, unquote. Populistic agrarian and republican democracy, the vision which still continues today. So I won't go into the poetry of this time. There were poets like Matthew Biles, and there were also poets like Nathaniel Evans and John Trumbull, Timothy Dwight, Joel Barlow. So why I won't focus on this is that these poems were largely derivative and the, there was no original poetic expression, so to speak. And these poets drew their inspiration from the English poets across the Atlantic who were writing at the time. However, two noteworthy poets of the age were Philip Frenot and Phyllis Wheatley. You know, Phyllis Wheatley was the first woman, also the first African-American poet of the United States. Right. And uh, Philip Frenot has a very famous poem called The House of Night, A Vision, you know, which is now widely regarded as having been the first romantic note heard in America, the first instance of romantic literature in America. With that, I move on to the 19th century. Mind you, the notion of Westering or the Western frontier is still continuing here. But we have crossed an important milestone, namely the attainment of sovereignty by the American people through the war of independence, which they fought against imperial Britain. Now, the 19th century continued with the nation building exercises that we that have already been undertaken right and uh, also the development of various national institutions less than a century after attaining nationhood however came the american civil war american civil war which was fought between the industrialist in, sorry industrialized and progressive north and the agrarian, slave-holding, plantation economy of the South. When I say North, I mean North of the American country, and South means the Southern part. Now, uh, the North, the liberated, progressive, urbanized, industrialized North, championed the freedom of the Negro slaves, while the South resisted the move. Okay. Now, before I go into the Howsoever briefly I try to sum up the civil war for you, I would just like to draw your attention to the five geographical zones of America. And these zones come with their attendant mythology. It's very important for you as students of American literature to be familiar with these zones. So while I'm discussing the history of the country, I would also like to dwell a little on the geography. Now we know the North. The North is very cold, climatically bleak, 
old, you know, and socially, economically, it is urban, industrialized, and ideologically progressive, you know. So the North would have, you know, all those Puritan co colonies in the first place, you know. Uh, it will have uh, Massachusetts, and New York, and all those uh, states which are up north. Now the South, which is latitudinally much lower, you know, is much warmer. It is largely rural. It used to be in the 19th century, till the 19th century. And it had a more relaxed rhythm of life. But more importantly, you know, the South was dependent on what was known as a plantation economy. You know, they grew the cash crops of uh, coffee, tobacco, cotton, coffee, tobacco, and cotton. So they were the landowners who had these plantations. Now, how could they work these plantations? They needed labor. So from where would they get the labor? They brought the Negro slaves mostly from the west coast of Africa. They transported them in horrifying conditions in the slave ships, you know, brought them to the country, immediately dis divided the family, you know, completely auctioned the slaves off, sold them off, you know, and this is how they worked their plantation economy. Right. But the South has its own mystique about it. And F. Scott Fitzgerald, the 20th century writer, has a beautiful short story called The Ice Palace, where he shows the protagonist, a young girl. You know, she belongs to the South. She gets married and goes off North. And how she cannot adapt to the coldness of the North, cold in every sense. You know. And she longs to come back to the warm, laid back, relaxed life of the South. So anyway, I've dealt with the North and the South. Now let me talk a little about the East eastern part of America. Excuse me. Now the East is sophisticated, cultured, and intellectual. And all of you know that the, today the Ivy League universities, you know, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and all those other great universities are clustered in the Eastern region. So the East is the intellectual East of America. And the West, just on the uh, shore of the Pacific Ocean, you know, the last to be developed by the uh, American people represents a different lifestyle, a different ethos altogether. The West has California, Los Angeles, you know, all these places which are associated with the entertainment world, with showbiz, it has Hollywood, you know. Again, climatically, it is very different, right? So the West has its own character. And also we are reminded of the Westerns, you know, the cowboy films, you know. So the, the topography that was shown in these films was very rugged. It is associated with rugged terrain and a rugged lifestyle and rugged characters, you know. So that is there. But we have a fifth zone, and this is the middle portion, the Midwest, you know. So the Midwest would be all those Ohio, Iowa and all those places. This was known as the grain bowl of America, you know, where we have the agriculture. So as they say of Punjab, of the Punjab in India, that it has agriculture and no culture. So also in America, it used to be the saying that the Midwest has uh, agriculture and not much culture. But I'm sure all those things have changed now. But basically, each of these zones has a distinct character, which is reflected in their art, in its art and uh, literature. Now, having said that, I will go back to my, I shall return to my uh, discussion of the American Civil War. Now, this broke out in 1861, 12th April 1861 to be precise, and lasted till 9th April 1865. You know. So these four or five years were tumultuous, you know, in the life of the nation. And uh, this should have been a time for consolidation and development, but we find that the young nation is embroiled in a very violent civil war, you know, which developed a, a mythology on its own, right? And on which issue mainly did the nation go to war? On the issue of slavery, 
the North wanted the emancipation or the freedom of the slaves and the South clung on to that notion because the whole economy would have collapsed if that came, if the slaves were free. But it, the, the North did win. They were called the uh, Yankees, you know. We use the word Yankee uh, to mean the entire American culture, but actually originally it pertained to the North. And the southern, Southerners were called the Confederates, Confederates or the Feds, so the Feds and the Yankees. But whatever it is, they, 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 the Yankees won the war, the slaves were freed, and they, what followed was a period of reconstruction, you know. But this was basically on paper, this freedom for the slaves. And they were yet to be assimilated, you know, and even today they are still not fully assimilated, as you can see from the Black Lives Matter campaign going on now. However, I will again, like I spoke about the Declaration of Independence, now I shall refer to the Jettysburg Address, G-E-T-T-Y-S-B-U-R-G, -T -T the Jettysburg Address, which was delivered by President Lincoln, you know, on November 19, 1863, on the battlefield near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's a very brief address. I shall just read out. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. You know? And then he goes on to say, we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And he goes on to say how honor should be given to the dead soldiers you know, who have fallen for this larger cause, right? And yeah, finally, he ends the address by saying that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth, unquote. You know, that famous quotation by Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, for the people, by the people. Sorry, of the people, by the people, for the people. And so now you know from where it has come, from his famous speech. It's a very brief speech, some 272 words or so. Right. So uh, we have come to the 19th century, which was driven by this deadly civil war. Nevertheless, you know, uh, there were poets and we have the poets and writers and uh, the first poet of note after Phyllis Wheatley and Philip Fresno in the independent United States was William Cullen Bryant, 1794 to 1878. And he rhapsodized the great outdoors. You know, he also promulgated this myth of the great outdoors. And was probably one of the pioneering spirits who helped develop the American myth of the wilderness, the, of the frontier, forests, rivers, and retreats that constituted the stretching hinterlands of a vast nation. And we see that writer upon writer, <coughs> excuse me, from James Fenimore Cooper, Mark Twain, Herman Melville, Nathaniel Hawthorne in the 19th century, William Faulkner and Ernest Hemingway in the 20th century have drawn upon the nourishing plenitude of this rich source, in part agrarian, riparian, that is pertaining to rivers and wild pertaining to the wilderness. So there's this great myth of the American outdoors, and why not? It's a huge continent, it has a huge hinterland, you know, it's not a small insular island nation like Britain. So the myth of the uh, outdoors, how it came to be uh, conceived in the first place. And the other poets were Henry Wadsworth, Longfellow, John Greenleaf, Whittier, James Russell Lowell, Oliver, Weldon, Holmes, and others, you know. And but the more important poets of this period of the 19th century include Ralph Waldo Emerson, you've heard his name, Edgar Allan Poe, and Henry David Thoreau, and a few others. But I, won't, I don't have too much time left, so I shall focus on Emerson and Thoreau, who came to establish a school of poetry known as the Transcendental School of Poetry. Right. So they searched for a distinct American voice you know, 
and they searched for uh, a kind of spiritual elevation in their poetry. Thoreau and Emerson. And we have, on the other hand, Edgar Allan Poe, who, was, who came to be associated with the tradition of horror, horror and the grotesque, you know. And all of you are aware of his poem, The Raven. You know. And uh, the poem Song of Hiawatha, the Song of Hiawatha by Longfellow, is points to another kind of search in the American poets of the time. So they were looking for a distinct American voice, and to that end, they used the native topography, customs, and beliefs to forge an authentic vernacular idiom and voice. And the Song of Hiawatha by Longfellow is a case in point, where the poet uses Native American tales, you know, and so on. And uh, so we have the development of what is known as the Gothic strain in the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. But two other poets I just have to uh, refer to. They are Walt Whitman, and you have his poems in your syllabus, and also Emily Dickinson, which is there in the syllabus. So while Whitman was came to be regarded as the conscience of his nation, he had this bardic voice, expansive notion and vision, you know, and who was a very public kind of a persona, participating in the nation-building discourses of the time. Emily Dickinson, on the other hand, was the great recluse. She was a reclusive poet, but nevertheless, very powerful, very cryptic, very subtle in her poetry. So the two late 19th century great American poets, that is Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson. Now, with that, we come to the 20th century, the advent of the 20th century and the modern age. And uh, modern age is characterized by the First World War, you know, and how it changed the cartography or the geographical boundaries, the, board, the boundaries of the world map, and uh, how it uh, kind of uh, changed, you know, human experience forever. So that is there. And uh, the technological advancements which were being made at this time, around this time, you know, they all contributed to a new kind of literature, a new sensibility known as the modern sensibility. And you know, you have the poems of T.S. Eliot in your course. And so how Eliot was uh, crafting a new idiom, a new vocabulary, a new sensibility, you know, in the modern age. So that is there. And also we have uh, another wave, a new wave of immigration where people from all over the world choose to come to America and settle there. So this is very, very important. This is different from the Puritan migrations or the 19th century migrations. The 20th century migrations were very different you know, because people from all over the world went to America. And we have this notion of multiculturalism. You know, the society and the civilization of America became very multicultural in nature and scope, right? And so there were literary articulations in Chinese, in, uh, in uh, Polish, you know, in there were the Jewish writers, the Japanese writers, you know. So there were so many ethnic uh, voices which came to be noticed in the colloquium of, in the literary colloquium of modern America. Now, because we are talking about multiculturalism and successive waves of immigration in the 20th century, you know, I will have to refer to what is known as the American dream. This American dream was a construct, an ideological construct, a myth. And it was James Truslow Adams who first coined the phrase American Dream in his 1931 book called The Epic of America. You know, and it is a powerful construct which is rooted in the Declaration of Independence. Remember 1775, which proclaims that, I quote, all men are created equal and have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of unhappiness, unquote. But basically, it came to mean different things to different people, you know. But there is one point in which the American dream is integrally located. That is, it refers to immigration because the immigrants come with different visions, you know, and 
the, in the, in our, the second point is that it relates to the American frontier. Because the frontier resonated with the promise of limitless possibility. Okay? And so we find that why did people come to America? What did they seek? Some sought a new identity, others material prosperity. Some others came for the novelty of discovery and freshness associated with the new world. But Adams explained it very well. And he says that they came for, I quote, that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone. Better, richer and fuller for everyone. With opportunity for each according to ability or achievement, unquote. This is one of the best definitions for the of the motivations for seeking the American dream. There was the California gold rush, which promised instant wealth to the prospectors. There was the Western frontier, you know, which is so important in American history, right? Uh, so it's kind of throbbing with the notion of possibility through geographical expansion and conquest of land freely available. But then for the blacks, for the African-Americans, the Negroes, it, it had certain other connotations. You have the poem, Langston Hughes's uh, poem, you know, Harlem, a dream deferred. So he is basically talking about this American dream. Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963 speaks of, I quote, standing up for what is best in the American dream, unquote. And it, but in this, he refers to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of America. You know, so, and Harlem in uh, uh, Langston Hughes, you know, he says that the blacks have not been given their due, they have not received justice, you know, at the hands of the American establishment. So for them, the American dream has not happened. It has not materialized. It has been forever de delayed and deferred. And as we all know, justice delayed is justice denied. So it's a very eloquent poem. So, and we have so many iconic texts or literature, you know, literary specimens in which this dream is reflected, the notion of the American dream. Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, we are reminded of Huckleberry Finn and the river odyssey of Huck and Jim. You know, if Jim, the runaway slave, can find freedom in the land of opportunity. F. Scott Fitzgerald's <coughs> novel, The Great Gatsby, which again explores another dimension of the American dream. That is the prosperity, you know, the material prosperity. Arthur Miller's death of a salesman, Willie Loman, you know, and his desire to be liked, you know, well liked. Langston Hughes' poem, Harlem, A Dream Deferred, and another poem by Hughes, Let America Be America Again. So there are so many, I've just culled a few examples, you know, to show to you how this notion of the American dream came to be integrally intertwined with the vision of the poets and writers, you know, who were articulating their vision of the nation. Now, in the 20th century, uh, we have uh, we have the modernist narrative, which is in part a philosophic and aesthetic reaction to the sweeping changes in the world, as seen in decolonization, the First World War, a rejection of the Enlightenment ethos, rapid industrialization, the consciousness of racism and gender discrimination, along with advances in science and technology. So we have modernist literature, I won't go into it, it will take a long time. And William Carlos Williams and a few other poets, you know, they became critical of Eliot and Pound's uh, version of modernism and they created the American version of modernism, you know. And what was this American uh, uh, vision? You know, they believed that the poem should be intelligible, you know, and uh, that uh, the ordinary reader should be able to understand it. It should have precision and wit, and it should use metrical effects, even as innovativeness is maintained. Then there were the second generation modernists who emerged in the 1930s. They were also called the objectivist poets, you know, and William Carlos Williams, George Open, Carl Precossi, Basil Bunting, and others. And the middle decades of the 20th century, 
we have the second world war we have the holocaust you know perpetrated by hitler in germany and so we have uh, the poets of the second world war you know karl shapiro randall jarrell james dickey who had seen active service in world war 2 then around this time we also have the emergence of the so called confessional poets such as sylvia plath and ann sexton who under the influence of john berryman and robert lowell explored and expressed their experiences in a carefully carefully crafted style we also have an explosion of beat poetry capital b e a t in the 1960s jack kerouac allen ginsberg gary snyder lawrence berlin hitty and others you know so the beat poets basically tried to break free of social sexual and aesthetic taboos you know to mint a new idiom of protest then there were the black mountain poets the san francisco poets the new york group of poets and so on right and we have the poets of the second world war and the holocaust poets of the holocaust and you have this poem in your course sylvia plath's daddy another poem by sylvia plath named the lady lazarus and sexton's poem after auschwitz these are all what is known as holocaust poets poems then we have black protest poetry beginning with the harlem renaissance in the 1920s the harlem renaissance was a very important movement in the 20s you know of the black people and then again we have another efflorescence of uh, uh, black renaissance in the civil rights movement of the 1960s and it continues in the black lives matter campaign currently going on right so with that we come to the contemporary times a, a little before that let us say the second half of the 20th century what is what what are the historical i'm coming to the end of my talk now what are the uh, historical <coughs> features that we come to see here there was the cold war all of you are aware of it the cold war between the united states and the erstwhile soviet union which kind of resulted in the vietnam war which lasted from 1955 to 1975 there were the space rivalries of the usa with the ussr erstwhile ussr in a bipolar world you know this was in the third quarter of the 20th century then the aids crisis became full blown in the final quarter of the last century and if we come to the 21st century we will have to take into account the arab american conflicts you know which aggravated the deteriorating socio economic condition of the time on the one hand we have globalization and the capturing attempt to capture world market but america has not succeeded where china has to a very great extent and uh, but we also find that there is a medical health Uh, issue with the uh, explosion of the AIDS pandemic in the world. Then, of course, we have the war on terror, very close to our times, you know, and the war on terror by declared by George Bush and you know contributed to by uh, successive presidents. So basically, what is this war on terror? This is an international military campaign launched by the United States. in the wake of the 9/11 attacks against mainly sunni fundamentalist groups that is the official description but we know i am not getting into that trouble territory at all but this is one of those ideological and political phenomena which forms to a large extent the background of this period so when we look at the poetry look at the literature it will obviously be influenced or shaped by this kind of a background so some of the recurrent themes in contemporary american poetry and by contemporary i mean the 21st century our times seem to be an awareness of racial difference and tension in most of the black and mixed race poets the negotiation of divergent cultures i was talking about different cultures multiculturalism different ethnicities and this is found in the work of julia alvarez naomi shahab nai there is the theme of political and military tensions exemplified in the vietnam war and the middle eastern question this is seen in the work of yusuf komunita vietnam war brian turner the second iraq war and uh, naomi nye arab arab american conflicts you know so there are these contemporary era wars which are dealt with by the poets of the time now the aids crisis with its attendant problems is seen in 
the poet D. A. Powell, Mary Howe, and Denise Smith. Gay or homosexual preoccupations are taken up by Denise Smith and a few other poets. Female desire and sexuality in the poetry of Deborah Landor, Bairsley Regdell, and Beth and Finnelli. You know. So we find these different voices coming together in the creative colloquium of America around this time. And also in this context, I would just before ending, I would like to mention that while I was referring to the multiculturalism of America, we have to keep in mind that in the 20th century, for a while it became, it was referred to as the melting pot. But from the melting pot, this whole notion changed and they began to call this multiculturalism the salad bowl. So the melting pot would be when, you know, you put everything into the vessel on the fire, on the plane, right? When you do that, things lose their distinct flavor and individuality. But if you cut a salad, then each vegetable or each fruit, you know, retains its particular characteristics. So the, let the races be there. Let them express their visions and views in their literature, you know, in written in American English, of course. But let them preserve their ethnic identities. So the evolution in the 20th century, evolution of American literature from the melting pot to the salad bowl. And then finally, we find that what is the 21st century characterized by? It is an age characterized by free wheeling aesthetic discussions, you know, reading groups, coffee house poetry sessions, little magazines, web zines. You will, students, you will know better of it than me. Poetry slams, open mics, chat books, audio CDs and social media platforms such as video clips, YouTube, Facebook, all these no doubt played a part in disseminating a culture of poetry and literature that is to a great extent performative and interactive. So the poetry that came to be written during this time of mass cultural participation is not a purely literary activity, you know, in that it is meant for private or classroom reading, but it's driven by a need for collective expression enactment, you're almost acting it out, and gratification. And hence the readings, slams, the contests, the rap music of the black civil rap poetry, and the social media projections. So historically, finally, I come to the end of my talk, uh, the historically the United States has evolved from its colonial bearings through statehood, the civil war, the period of reconstruction, the Jim Crow era law, when there was a lot of racial segregation. The Harlem Renaissance, you know, the movement whereby the blacks began to assert themselves. They realized they are no longer cultural orphans, but they have a heritage, a cultural legacy of their own. The Cold War period, the Vietnam War era, the civil rights era, the Arab-American conflicts to the present age, you know, which is characterized by the so-called war on terror. And if you look at the ideological or the literary uh, aspect, we would see that American literature as also society has moved from Puritanism in the 17th century, through Deism in the 18th century, through Romanticism, it's different phases of Romanticism in the 19th century, to Naturalism, to Modernism in the 20th century, to Postmodernism in its literary evolution. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you for being with me and for having, uh, you know, listened to it. Uh, it's a very uh, wide territory, expansive in scope. I don't know to what extent I was able to do justice to it, but I really tried to condense a lot of material within the span of a short talk. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. You have touched upon all those historical, political, and cultural aspects of American literature. And, and I think it would be very pertinent and significant for our students to understand uh, American literature more uh, purposefully. Uh, thank you, Animesh. So, thank you, ma'am. Uh, now the session is open up for uh, questions. Uh, if, if you have any question, you can ask.
I'm open to questions. Students, please ask. Yes, if you have any question, please ask, ma'am. Anything, anything, any observation you have to make, you would like to add to the class. Come on, this is an interactive platform. Feel free to ask whatever you wish. Please unmute yourself, students, and ask questions. I would love to answer. Did you understand the talk? Yes, ma'am. There yeah. is one question. Yeah. It has been asked by Aratrik Nandi. He is asking what happened with the Native Americans who yes. were living before British very, colonialism. Very, 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 very good question. I didn't have time to get into that discourse. You know, the Native Americans, as you know, are the original inhabitants of the continent, or they were there in the north. North American continent as also in the South American continent. And then we have these imperialists, these colonists going and taking over the land. You know, they just take the land and they feel that it is freely available to them. And the original settlers were there. So one would assume that the land belonged to the Native Americans, you know. So, but they forcibly took away their land and they, you will have asked what happened to them. Yes. So they put these people, after a couple of centuries of skirmishes with them, eventually, you know, the machinery of the national government of America was proved to be stronger. And so they were put down, they were systematically decimated. There was so much variety, ethnically speaking, so many different tribes, you know, but they were systematically decimated. Mass exterminations used to be carried out. And they today they are found put in reservations, you know. They are called these there are these ghettos where they are put, you know, and so that is their fate. And in fact, you have a poem in your course called Crow Testament by Sherman Alexi. By Sherman Alexi, Crow Testament. And that is a very moving, very beautiful, eloquent, and powerful poem where he talks about a million nests being soaked in blood, you know, and so on. Right. And he, he talks about life in the Indian reservation. And so we come to know of this politics of appropriation. This whole nation, this concept of the white nation, it is founded on a lie. It is founded on, uh, you know, cruelty, on appropriation. Right? Have I been able to get my point across? So that is something that we cannot really uh, overlook, you know. There is the white narrative on the one hand and the politics of appropriation, which they engaged in taking away land, a country which did not belong to them. You know. And then they, through the myth of the frontier, through the saga of the frontier, they extended the explorations, you know, killing the killing the Native Americans. And there was so much variety. And today, in fact, there is uh, there are quite a few uh, Native American poets, you know, Joy Harjo. I had the good fortune of meeting Joy Harjo in the American Center many years ago, you know. So Joy Harjo is there and very many other poets and Sherman, Alexi and so on. And they're writing very powerfully. They're writing in their own voice. They're recuperating their own idiom, right? And as I was telling you that, so the nation has been founded on this basic injustice. And after the frontier was formally closed, they are now expanding into, expanding, sorry, into kind of world conquest that is what that was the basic plan yes have i answered the question are you satisfied with the answer yes ma'am definitely okay thank uh, you so much there Any is another you? question huh? yeah there is another question it has been asked by neha shaw she is asking mm -hmm. uh, what is the influence of western existential thought on american culture and literature well, everything was derived from the from Europe, and Western existential thought, existentialist thought, you know, it was uh, in the nineteenth, in the second half, latter half of the twentieth century, nineteen sixties, and so, so on. So we have here also, you know, Edward Albee and the others, you know, 
who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. So this thing crossed over from that land. We have Harold Pinter, uh, we have Samuel Beckett in, you know, writing in French, Harold Pinter, and so on in English. Then, uh, so this influence did percolate into America as well. So the European influence was there, and we do have the American articulation as well, but it is not that pronounced because there were so many, um, you know, what we call simultaneous movements, you know, going on. There are the confessional poets writing, there's the Holocaust poetry being written, beat poetry, you know. So America is a very rebellious country by nature. So they are always trying to redefine the moment, so to speak. So the influence, the, the level of influence that was felt in England, you know, by the continental or European existential existentialist thought of Sartre, Camus, and the others, was perhaps not to that extent felt in America. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Uh, other than prose, was any other genre of literature available during 18th century in America? I think so. Yes, of course. I did mention the two major poets, remember? Philip Fenno and his long poem, The House of Night. He was basically a journalist, Philip Fresno, a polemicist, and he came to sound the romantic note. You know, one of the earliest romantic notes was sounded by Philip Fresno and also Phyllis Wheatley who had been actually auctioned in the slave market. And there was a very benevolent white family, the Wheatley family, who had bought her and who had taught her, educated her. And she became a wonderful writer, a wonderful uh, poet, right, in the 18th century, right? And in the 17th century, we had Anne Bradstreet. But in the 18th, we have this woman poet called uh, Phyllis Wheatley. But it, he writes more within the conventional parameters, you know, and she, she writes, about, she, she doesn't get into any acrimonious debate vis-a-vis -vis the black question because she had been given good treatment in the hands of her, uh, the, the white family, you know, which had bought her. So her poems are very beautiful, very powerful and extraordinarily erudite for a person in her situation to have written. So yes, you are right. The prose expression was more. Definitely there were more prose writers, as I mentioned. William Byrd, you know, his uh, Samuel Sewell. There was another writer called Samuel Sewell, whose diary was uh, found and decoded in 1941, I think. And there's a wonderful document documentation of life in the American South. I mean, William Byrd then, who wrote about, you know, his visit to the mines and the uh, uh, charting of the state boundaries, various boundaries between Carolina and Virginia and so on. So as I, then there was Benjamin Franklin, his autobiography, you know, so uh, Tom Paine, all these people. So basically they were, this is the narrative of nation building, how the great and popular institutions of American life came to be established. Clever you are writing about who is the American? The forging of the um, psyche of the American person. How is he different from the European? Because he's an inhabitant of the new world, he's necessarily different. So the prose writing, because it was an age of reason, it was an age of prose and reason and enlightenment, you know, it came to dominate. But yes, there were a few noteworthy poetic articulations during this time. So thank you. Uh, if there are other questions, please feel free to ask. Yes. Anything at all, because it was such a long period that I undertook. Any question on the American dream, on the Western frontier? These are certain ideas you know, which are integrally related to American literature. I was talking well, about the, uh, no further question. Yes, okay. please continue. I was talking about the beat poets, and in this regard, I mentioned Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg had come to Kolkata, 
you know he had visited the uh, visited kali ghat the kali temple you know and he has a poem called uh, september in jessor road you know so these connections are also there so anyway i don't think there are any further questions yes so i think so there are no further question all right so anish uh, Okay, excuse me thank sir thank you once again excuse yeah, me yes, sir. Sir. sir as this is the last class i would like to say something okay yes uh, on on behalf of every student who have attended the, attended this special lecture series i would like to thank you all respected principal and all the other professor who took the pain of conducting these online classes for us like in such tough times when our study is at, uh, like has been put on stake this was a very helpful initiative taken by kk das college thank you so much thank welcome you. if thank you have you been uh, benefited yes thank we really appreciate this thank you so much sir uh when i think we can now officially call this session off uh thank you once again ma'am thank you for this interactive session and thank you for uh, being with us uh my pleasure and, and for Okay, and for our students, just uh, I just want to remind them that uh, there are there is feedback form already given on this chat box as well as the Google Classroom. Uh, you must fill up all those forms, right? Uh, for future endeavors, it would be very beneficial for us. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon.